We all lead busy lives, but if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there, now we can see the multitudes. We are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, corners of the world that have no access to the gospel. We train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort, together.
Fue el momento donde ya no pude más. Teníamos muchos enfrentamientos yo y ella, pues. Yo, yo ya no puedo y a veces... Yo decía que ya estaba cansada. Ahí lloré, lloré todo lo que yo sentía. Le dije adiós. Aquí estoy. Sinaloa is known for being the breadbasket of Mexico. Fields everywhere here. All around it are these work camps. Different people groups in Mexico, seasonal workers, they're often up at four, getting on a bus. Days are long, the work is hard. You see the effects of that in the challenges of their daily life. Adelia really struggled with depression, diabetes, was losing her sight. Gilberto and his wife, Udelia, they had gone through, I think, enough grief in their life where they were looking for something else. Yo le dije, ¿sabes qué, Ude? Eh, vamos a buscar algo, le dije, porque yo, yo ya no puedo y a veces... Y ya estaba el momento de serme loca. La depresión ya no aguantaba, ya no dormía. Dice, la iglesia es dócil a Cristo. 
Y ahí fue que un campo conocí al hermano David. Y la predicación estuvo muy bonito. Me decían mis compañeras de trabajo, ¿qué tienes, Udega? Te veo muy emocionada. Es que me voy a bautizar ahora. Y ahí fue donde Dios me limpió. Dios me salvó de todo. Sí, Dios es lo que quiere que gente que viene de campos, que viene de, pues, de pueblitos que no hay. Dios quiere que todos estemos con Él. Mi hija también andaba un poco... Y en el mismo instante, Dios tocó su corazón y dijo, Apá, Amá, yo también, dijo. We just began working through the book of Acts. They have always taken the initiative. One day, Gudelia said, You know, I would really like to go visit a different camp with you. They have just been so excited about sharing their faith. All last year we were doing training with Gudili and Hilberto of this is how you disciple people, this is how you share your faith. It's been so cool to see Hilberto grow in his confidence and ability to share. I can't imagine a more joyful person in Christ. She wants to share, she wants to engage, she wants to be used by God so badly. Like he said to Peter, go out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. New believers are added to the church. They're worshiping, they're praying. Si Dios es lo que quiere que, como nosotros estamos en Cristo, Dios quiere que todos estemos con Él para el día de su llegada, pues todos. Let me read something for you. Uh, and after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. This is from Revelation 7 and 9. Uh, it it kind of gives us a glorious glimpse of what heaven will be like. Uh, not just those that are in here, not just of our skin color, it's going to be a nation uh, that's going to be made up of multitudes throughout the world. Uh, today is the beginning of a uh, week of prayer for uh, Lottie Moon. A lot of y'all uh, might not be familiar with what Lottie Moon is, but that's our gifts to our foreign missionaries. Uh, like Joseph spoke uh, last week, he's one of our foreign missionaries uh, over in uh, a country not to be named. But he is uh, experiencing uh, sometimes trials, uh, coming in contact one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the people group that he's uh, associating with. Uh, let me give you a few statistics. The Lottie Moon Christmas Offering is an annual collection by the IMB, the National Mission Board, that supports 3,692 missionaries throughout the world. And they're taking the gospel this is pretty amazing. Uh, they're taking the gospel to some four, and this will be four billion, 488 million, 180,840 unreached, unreached people of the world. Uh, in the last year alone, your prayers and gifts have helped plant 13,898 churches throughout the world. Uh, and as you saw in that video, it begins with one-on-one, -on -one, and then from that one-on-one, -on -one, that person sh shares Christ. Once they accept Christ, they share Christ to other villages, to other people, and the churches are formed. Um, and this trains 18,428 pastors and baptized 52,586 new believers. And there's a lot, as you can see, four billion people out there that uh, uh, need to know Christ. Um, and so missionaries there on the field, one-on-one, -on -one, every day, meeting the challenges of sharing the gospel to their communities. So the Light of Christmas offering, you'll see here in your, uh, your bulletins this morning, we have 
kind of uh, information on several different uh, uh, missionaries. There are uh, different fields of service. So again, take this each day if you can this week. Brief prayer in your time of prayer, morning, night, whenever during the day. And reach out uh, to God to bless these people, to reach out to put a hedge of protection around them uh, in their daily walk. Uh, also, you'll see in the, uh, these are in the, uh, in the pews. This is uh, the offering uh, envelope. You can stick it in here. We have some also outside uh, on the, in the wealth desk. So again, uh, during this time, this week, throughout the Christmas season, uh, think of our missionaries out there on the field. Uh, mostly want, they want your prayers. Uh, that's what goes in all things. Thank you. If you want to stand again, we're going to continue worshiping. tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own Brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken It's my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your
pray with me this morning? Father God, we are, we are grateful and thankful this week and Lord, every week uh, that you sent your son to come and to die in our place to exchange his perfect goodness for our sinfulness. And he took that sin upon himself on the cross, paid the price that we should have paid. And through that, through his resurrection, we have forgiveness in Christ and we have forgiveness. And God, there's nothing else that we can be thankful for today other than that. So God, I pray if there's somebody here today that does not know you as Savior and Lord, I pray that today be the day that they come to know you and have saving faith and they have a life that has been changed and they can forever be thankful for the Son and for the crucifixion and the resurrection. And Lord, we are just thankful and grateful today for Jesus. And God, I pray that as we seek to show our community called Bellwood and as we seek to show the world and we go to the ends of the earth with the gospel through Lottie Moon and through missionaries that uh, go uh, from us and through other churches across the world, Lord, we pray that you uh, use people to connect you and to connect them with Christ. And God, we are just thankful and we are grateful today. So Lord, we pray as we take a time just to give, Lord, we pray that you use this money uh, to bless this community with the gospel, to bless this world with the gospel. Lord, help us to do uh, kingdom work um, here in this place. And Lord, we pray in just a moment as we hear from Pastor Pat, Lord, we pray that you open our hearts and minds to be changed by the power of the gospel today. So Lord, we say all of this and we pray all of this. And Lord, we want everything to be glorifying and honoring to you in this place today. So Lord, we ask you to do that and we ask you to do that through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Choose to pray. To 
Yes, I will choose to praise. It is a choice that you make to remember God's goodness and to praise his holy and awesome name. And I want to fast forward into my message this morning, which I started three weeks ago. Three words, remember, remind, and run. Let's start with remember, which we did last time. You can pull up that service if, if you weren't there. But I want to encourage you to remember right now and, and to start off by closing your eyes for just a moment. And I guess you could pray if you want, but um, I want you to close your eyes and to think about on um, Thanksgiving weekend all the ways God has blessed your life. Think about the things he did for you this week, this year. Think about the things he's given you in your life. In the, in the Psalms, we praise him and it says the Lord gives and he takes away. And sometimes as human beings, we are guilty of, of um, well, we're just, we're, we're we grieve over those things we've lost that he's taken away. It's very hard to deal with that. It's hard for us to accept that. But right now, I want you to think about the things he's given you. And yes, even things he's taken away. Either way, blessed be the name of the Lord. Talk to him. Move into a time of prayer right now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Thank him. You don't have to pray this out loud. But remember the ways he blessed you with a great meal on Thursday. With a family. Some of you have kids, some of you have grandkids, some of you have great-grandchildren. We have so many reasons to say thank you. Remember how faithful he has been to you. Today, we, the, the first words of this text says, Remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ, your Savior. If you know the Lord, if you've been saved, you have every reason to say thank you. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for giving me heaven. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Thank him. Praise him. There's nothing more important. This is the perfect time of the year where we remember our freedoms that were, were given to us on the cross, our freedoms that were given to us in our nation, our liberties, our family, our health, our blessings. And Lord Jesus, we say thank you. We do remember how great and how awesome you are. And we remember our Savior uh, crucified, risen from the grave. And we choose to praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and, and we want to jump right into this thing. We are talking about leadership. We are talking about disciple-making. Good leaders inspire those they lead to prioritize what is essential. If you're a good father, you're che teaching your children to prioritize what is most important. If you're a good mother, if you, if you lead something in the church, if you lead at work, you, you, whatever, wherever you work, there's a bottom line. There's, there's something that's supposed to happen. You are there for a reason. That's what you, is the priority. Good leaders inspire those they lead to prioritize that which is essential. And what we saw in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 8, was number one, remember. Remember the power of the gospel. If you're keeping notes, this is from last time, but you can fill in those blanks. And if you, if you missed it, you can, you can pull up that sermon on, online if you'd like. Remember the power of the gospel. The text says, remember Jesus Christ, crucified, risen from the grave. He's our Savior. Remember the gospel. It's the most important thing. It's what the world needs. Secondly, remember the sufficiency of scriptures. The, 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 the sufficiency of the word of God. Remember the sufficiency of the scriptures. God's word is holy, infallible, inspired. It's powerful. And then thirdly, remember the demands of discipleship. Remember the demands of discipleship. Paul is writing from a prison. He, he, he's, been, he's, been, um, he's lost his freedom because of the gospel and of the word of God and, 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 and his confidence in both of those things and taking them to people who needed to hear it. 
there's a high cost of discipleship. I had a dinner with uh, an individual recently who told me um, th- th- this person's in a book club with mainly people who do not know the Lord. And, and, and this person shared their, 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 just their faith, their belief in Jesus. And she's not been invited back. There's a cost to following Jesus. There's a cost to saying, yeah, I'm a believer. I trust the word of God. There's a, there's a demand of being a disciple. The demands of being a disciple are more than what many people realize. Now today, we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 14. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. I want to read the first four verses, and we'll just jump right in and get going. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Starting in verse 14, because we've said, remember, remember those things. Now we're into the remind section of this. And that's what verse 14 says, remind. If you're a pastor, your job, my, my job description is to remind you of things constantly that you may already know, but you're supposed to be reminded about them. As parents, are we not reminding our children constantly about things? Remind them of these things in verse 14. And charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, the word of God, rightly handling it, dividing it, understanding it, explaining it. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenius and Philetus. This is not the first time Paul called people out by name for being troublemakers. (laughs) <laughs> and having divisions and fighting. They've swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. I'll stop reading there for now. So what do we need to remind people about? Well, we need, we need to remind believers a few things. Number one, remind believers to be serving Jesus diligently. Remind believers to be serving Jesus Diligently. Now, that's my job. I'm to remind you that that this is what you need to do. This is what you're going to be happy. I mean, my mother is still reminding me about things. We spent the the week with family, and she reminds me of things all the time. I'm a grown man. She reminds me, you need to eat healthy, Pat. You need to get on that treadmill. Be nice to your wife, stuff like that. She's not afraid to remind me. My dad... You never outgrow the need, and you never get too old. You should never stop, Dad, grandparents, great-grandparents. Keep reminding them, teachers, preachers. And what I'm reminding you of today is you need to serve Jesus diligently. Verse 15, that's our Awana verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study, be diligent, do your best, it might, your translation might say. It's okay for Christians to aspire for excellence and to say, do your best. Let's do our best getting this facility looking great and and, and, and spending all the money we need to to get the bathrooms right. It is inconvenient, is it not? Why it would start raining and get horrible on a day, the the day, ah. It's inconvenient. It's a pain. Why are we doing this? We're trying to make things the best they can be. Teachers, if you're like me, you spent a lot of time, hopefully this week, maybe last night, Getting ready for this morning because you wanted to say something. You wanted to do your best. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Respect the men and the women who are teaching to correctly divide and, 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 and exegete, explain the word of God. Study his word and, av- and avoid time wasters. Three times Paul in this chapter is going to warn them, uh, Timothy, to abstain from vain quarrels in debates. Now, the last time we were together, I gave you the quote from C.T. Studd. You you may remember, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We need to be serving our King. When we look to the future, we have amazing opportunities to serve Jesus in a community in the next year by serving people in Bellwood. Will you diligently serve your King? You can feed people in this neighborhood in order, in order to give them spiritual food. You can reach your neighbors here in Chesterfield. You can get on a plane and fly to Lithuania in the next year. All of these opportunities will be at your disposal. 
And it will always be inconvenient. It will always be costly, but it will always be worth it. Teenagers are going to have an opportunity to go to D.C. This, this summer and serve people and serve Jesus by serving people. We have our Light of the Moon missions offering. We're, we're kicking off today. Did you know, and I think William may have shared some of these statistics with you, it's estimated that over seven, there are 7.47 billion people alive on planet Earth. 3.15 billion of them live in unreached people groups with little or no access to the gospel. The Joshua Project studied all this. Joshua Project said, went out and, and found these statistics. There are approximately 16,800 unique people groups in this world, with about 6,900 of them considered unreached. The vast majority of them have never heard of Jesus. They've never seen a Bible. They've never been given the gospel. So we just did Operation Christmas Child. Christmas Child. If, you, if, you, if you made a box, raise your hand. Everybody that put, made a box, raise your hand. Man, that's awesome. Good job. I know Joan Chauncey appreciates that. I don't know how many thousands of boxes we collected in of the boxes, the shoe boxes we collected in our gym. Just because we love people, we want to share Jesus with little children. You can serve in the nursery. You can join the van ministry. You can join the security ministry, the audiovisual ministry. You can be a greeter. You can work with the youth, Awana, Keepers at Home, Contenders of the Faith, and so much more. Your help is needed around here. Our missionary also said, and thank you, William, for reminding us of our missionary. He, he quoted that passage where Jesus said, the fields are white under harvest. Pray the Lord of harvest will send out workers into the field. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's an interesting thing to say because Joshua, I guess, had a wife, kids, all that. How can you make, you can't make your kids do that. They, they may, he, may, he was an old man by then. He may have had adult children. And yet he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is the individual people in, in the household that make those decisions for themselves. But let it be said, as for me in this house, and as for you in your house, and as for me in my house, we're going to serve Jesus. And my job, according to this text, is to remind you of these things, verse 14. To be diligent, to do your best. Why is it that we're willing to do our best for a little league team or for whatever, some thing at school? Do your best here. This is the most important thing you'll do in your life. So our vision 2020, or our 2020 vision, we were talking a lot about that. Met with my, the leaders about that before I left town. And here we are today. We'll be laying this out for you over the next weeks and months and heading into the year 2020. We want to bless Bellwood. Particularly leading up to Easter. Going back and helping people in our neighborhood. And, and starting with our food distribution. To feed those who are hungry. We want to upgrade our property. And we're doing it right now. We want to worship with red hot passion. Not just going through the motions, not just showing up. We want to see people worshiping Jesus. We want to create atmospheres where people will worship seven days a week. And we want to be a disciple-building church. I want to be a disciple-maker, a disciple-builder. I want to encourage you to do it. And, 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 and you lead someone to Christ and disciple them and teach them to disciple somebody. So we want to see our small groups stronger and thriving. So rem the reminder is to serve the Lord. The second reminder is to be set apart. To be set apart. Look down at verse 19. But God's firm foundation stands bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone who names the, Lord of, the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. That means clean up your act. Get off that stuff. Uh, be set apart. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some honorable for use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful for the master. I want to be useful for the master. I want you to be useful for the master. I'm supposed to remind you to serve the master and to be set apart for the master. And I could just say it like that, or I could get all into your business. I typically choose the, the latter. Because, I mean, oh, just be set apart. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's talk about what that means. Does anybody still have fine china? If you have china in your house, like the dishes, raise your hand, okay. 
uh, my mother was frustrated that, that the fine china, the, the younger generation didn't want the fine china that they were trying to give to some of the younger ladies. They didn't appreciate the fine china. Did anybody use fine china this week for your Thanksgiving feast? A few of you did? Sure, sure. Um, back in the day, people had fancy silverware and fancy dishes that they would use at special occasions, right? Fine china. If you can't understand that, maybe you can understand like an expensive instrument, like a violin or, or a, a fancy guitar. Or here's one, your children. Do you have a, a child that you look at as, I have three of them, that, that I look at as, as very special? That's actually more important than china or instruments, isn't it? Human beings. Well, God looks at you as a child, and he loves you. You're important to him, and it's saying he wants you to be holy and set apart. Set apart. He could do things with your life that you can't even imagine, that are just beyond your comprehension. He wants to do something with your life, whatever age you may be. He's not done with you. A few weeks, weeks ago, I went to Maryland with my boys. We went up to watch a basketball game, and we drove by some property in Calvert County called Life. It had a big sign on it, Life Church Calvert. Life Church Calvert. Well, I know that church because my buddy started it. Steve, who I was going to show you a picture of. I forgot to even do this before I left on my trip. Steve Forrester was my buddy. We played baseball together, and, and I love that guy. We were friends. Went through high school together. I left he stayed. Steve's the pastor of Life Church Calvert. I'm so proud of him. He stayed in his hometown. And, and when he was just a little boy, I had no idea he would be the pastor of Life Church Calvert. My dad used to walk, to, did his um, granddad's carpet. His granddad was a state senator in Maryland, Bernie Fowler. Bernie Fowler is one of the main people, out of a lot of people, but the main, one of the main people who cleaned up the Patuxent and the Chesapeake. So, this kid, Steve, who has this great political heritage and all that, he's now a man my age. And all the way back then, God had a plan for him. And all the way back then, God had a plan for me. I didn't know what Kingsland Baptist Church was. All I knew about Richmond was that was where King's Dominion lived. That's all I cared about. God had a plan for my life. God had a plan for his life. A few years ago, I went to Bible college with a guy named Ben in 1993. I went to Word of Life Bible Institute with a guy named Ben. And Ben, uh, I don't even know Ben. I know we went to the Bible Institute together, and I think I remember him. I don't know if he remembers me. But um, a couple weeks ago, Ben Gutierrez was called to be the pastor of Grove Avenue Baptist Church. He was just a Bible college, Bible Institute kid all those years ago. I don't know all the twists and turns his path has led him to this point, but now he's pastoring an incredibly influential church in our city, a church that we need to do well, we want to do well. They're on NBC this morning, live. And his ministry will start there in a few weeks when he moves up. And I, I, I pray that God uses him greatly there. And I just, just think about people I've known over the years. God has done amazing things through their lives. Some of them used to sit in that section right there, and they're off pastoring church and doing missions work right now. So we need to be servant-minded and set apart. Set apart. You know, you're the best person to do whatever you're, God called you to do. You're uniquely qualified and equipped. He has given you a mission, a calling, a purpose. So embrace your divine vision and mission and pray, Oh God, set me apart for your special use. Oh God, what crucial thing did you create me to do? So I hope that you'll pray that today. I hope that'll be something you think about and that you'll, you'll personalize. Let's, let's go to the last one. Run. Run. And it's very specific in verse 22, so let's just get to it because this kind of goes along with being set apart. Run away from the flesh. Lust. Look at the verse part of verse 22. So, Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That's your church, friends. We're supposed to work together, to serve together, to hold each other accountable, and to flee youthful lust, to run away from the flesh. 
That's a carnal attitude, a world, a carnal worldview. You know, men and women lust after different things, don't they? But they both lust. This is an uncomfortable subject, let's be honest. We're not going to pass the microphone now. What do you lust over? No. Um, think about, have, have, any, have you seen the 2020 Corvette? Has anybody seen the new Corvette? You need, I mean, it's awesome. That's something, I mean, you shouldn't lust, but that's something that's amazing. If I were going to lust after something, it might be a 2020 Corvette. It could be that new gal or that new guy at work or that old flame that has been sparked up through social networking. Something that appeals to your flesh, money, material possessions, accolades, social status. It could be a person, a thing, or even a feeling. It says flee youthful lust. Do you realize that you don't have to be young to struggle with youthful lusts? It's the whole point of what it says. It doesn't say don't be a, a goofy teenager. It says flee youthful lusts. In other words, youth should, but it's talking to everybody. Flee youthful lust. Run away from the flesh. Don't even visit that place. Don't talk to him or her. Install a filter uh, on, your, on your computer or whatever. Turn on the parental controls to block those channels. Or just cancel the subscription to those channels. Cancel the, that cable channel. I, I love saying that when we're on the Friday night cable channel. Um, they will be kicking us off soon, I bet. I bet. Refuse to be alone with someone of the opposite sex. Set super duper hard lines with that person you're dating. Throw away the profane music and movies. Unfriend that person from Facebook or Instagram or whatever you're on. And don't drive near the liquor store if that's a problem for you. I could go in the liquor store. If you see me in there, it's not a problem for me. It probably would become a problem for me if I kept going over there and, and all that. But I remember my mother needed some sort of bourbon or something for her horse. Do you remember that? And she sent me in to get it. She would not go in that place. She sent me in to get the... Um, liquor, whatever it was that goofy horse needed. But if you have a problem with that, stay away from it. Um, run. Run. How would you handle a snake? How would you handle a hand grenade? How would you deal with a hungry bear or lion? Run. Run. <laughs> Get out of there. A few years ago, David Roden, a few months ago, David Rodenheiser, who's become just a dear mentor to me. He spoke here for our family conference. Do you remember that? And I forget if he said it publicly or if he just said it when we were at dinner. He's a 65, 70-year-old pastor. He said, I don't want to blow it. I sincerely want to finish well without ever bringing shame to the name of Christ. That really stuck in my mind. And I wrote it down. I feel the same way. Sadly, Dr. Rodenheiser and I have several friends. We share friends, mutual friends, who were at one time very successful in the ministry, but they fell. They fell because they chose the flesh. They chose lust. They chose momentary pleasure. A few years ago, his church planted a church out in Virginia Beach. It became one of the greatest churches and still is one of the largest churches in Virginia Beach. Very famous pastor who, it's now been two decades ago, decided to trade in his ministry for momentary pleasure. Ruined his testimony. Ruined, ruined his ministry. Youthful lusts. In other words, if it feels good, do it. That's youthful lusts. If it feels good, do it. Probably if it feels good, don't do it most of the time, right? The flesh, whatever I want right now with no thought to what God wants or whatever is best long term for me, my spouse, my family. Lust is, is, is very urgent. It's very passionate. It's very selfish and reckless and destructive. Write down Proverbs 5 and Proverbs 7. Read that on your own talks about the man who's totally ensnared by lust and falls in with the adulteress and ruins himself. Run from it. But the verse goes on to say, let's get positive. The verse goes on to say, pursue. Rather, run from the flesh, and, and rather than going after the flesh, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord. That's your church family. That's your Bible study class. So rather than pursuing youthful lusts and, and foolishness, pursue good things with other believers and disciples who desire to do the same. That could be, that could be the Silver Saint group on, on Tuesday. I can't wait to hang out with the senior Silver Saints on Tuesday. That could be your Bible study class. 
or an accountability group. In all seriousness, it could be a celebrate recovery group that you join or an AA group that's helping you to get on the right path. So run away from the flesh. Secondly, run away from distractions. Run away from distractions. The, the passage goes on to say in verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant controversies. You know that that just leads to quarrels. Unnecessary controversy, time wasters, joy killers. Stay away from the distractions. It could be sports debates on the radio or, or the, 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 the cable uh, news political debates going on and on and on about the same thing. You don't have to watch that 24-7. You could probably watch 15 minutes of that and know what's going on. Debating, um, and, and the, the sports people, they have to find controversy. You know, who is better, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Who cares? It makes no difference. Don't waste your life on that stuff. Especially with other Christians. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we don't need the distractions. I thank God for those individuals in my life and in this church who kindly, faithfully, graciously teach the Word of God. That's what it's saying to do here. It's one reason why we do church, so that we can fight the good fight together as a family who loves each other and wants to please our Father together. So run away from the flesh, run away from the distraction, and, and then lastly, and this is kind of the, the grand finale of this whole thing, run after the lost. Run after the lost. Our focus must be on the lost who will spend eternity in hell if they don't hear and embrace the gospel. And, and William shared some statistics. I've shared some statistics. Here it is. 100% of people who never hear the gospel, they die and go to hell. Why? Because no one like you or me or one of our missionaries ever bothered to share with them the gospel. We need to run to the lost. Go back to verse 24. And the Lord's servant must, be, must not be quarrelsome, and this is mainly to pastors, must be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. That's black and white, ladies and gentlemen. Satan has a will for people. Satan has a plan for your kids and your grandkids. Satan has a plan for our church, for us to hate each other, eat each other alive. That's why it says three times, don't bicker, don't fight. Run away from the flesh. Run away from the distractions. But this part tells us to run after the lost. Let me ask you a question. Do you care? Are you willing to inconvenience yourself for others? Are you willing to risk your reputation and comfort in an effort to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying? Because Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save he uses us to be his hands and his feet. How far are you willing to go out of your way to step out of your comfort zone to reach somebody else? Heard a story about one of our church members, Lisa Moore, this week, who did CPR on somebody and saved their life. That's amazing. That's, that's astounding. My cute little niece married a guy, Michael, trained to be a school teacher, did that for one year and quit. I never want to do it again. He's now an EMT. He's out rescuing people's lives. His brother, talked to their dad this week, told me his brother and his brother and wife have just accepted a calling to move to Lebanon and do missions work there. Have nothing but respect for someone who's willing to inconvenience themselves to that level to go right there in the 1040 window where so many of those lost people groups and those lost people live. Chicago, November 3rd, 2019. A veteran police officer of the SWAT group, a medic, Sergeant Mike Nowaki, ran in the Allstate 
hot chocolate 15K. He ran in the 15K while wearing his gear. 50 pounds of gear. He ran the 15K with, with the gear on. As he neared the end of the race, Nowaki noticed a woman in the crowd who was having a health episode. Turns out she was going through cardiac arrest. She had no pulse and was not breathing. He abandoned the race, he jumped into action, and he started doing chest compressions and saved her life. Paramedics arrived shortly after, gave the woman oxygen, and loaded her onto an ambulance. She lived. This guy is a hero. He was willing to do what was necessary to save a life. Are you willing to intervene? Nobody's asking you to run a 15K here, okay? Especially wearing 50 pounds of uh, equipment. But will you simply speak out? Will you share the good news that you've been given? It's a very simple question. Will you do it? I'm not, I'm not telling you how to do it. We will give you tools and all that. The question, will you? Will you? Sergeant Nowaki, by the way, finished the race that day and immediately found his girlfriend, who's also a police officer, and he got down on one knee and he proposed to her. She said no. Just kidding. She said yes. That was her original plan. That was his original plan. I just look at something like that and think, how far are they willing to strive and to run the race and to actually to save people's lives? And, all? and, and we have the most important thing on earth, the gospel. You need to run to those who need help. Share the soul-saving message of the gospel. Overcome your fear of rejection and reach out. Good leaders inspire the people they're, living, they're leading to do that which is essential, that which is the most important. And what is most essential is the gospel, the, soul, the eternal souls of men and women, the word of God, the blood of Jesus, the truth, the reality of heaven and hell. The good news that heaven is accessible. I am trying to be a good pastor. Notice I didn't say I am a good pastor. I'm trying to be a good pastor. And I want to tell you, you need to remember certain things. Jesus Christ, his gospel, his word, the demands of being a disciple. And I want to remind you today that serving him is the best way you could ever invest your life. Whether you're young or old, or everybody in between, we should encourage each other. We should uh, inspire each other to serve Jesus. That's my heart. Remember that God really, sincerely, deeply loves you. Never forget that. Could we ever say that enough? God seriously loves you. He knows you, and he loves you. Even if you're living in rebellion toward him, he loves you anyway. He died for you because he loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. So pursue him. Run away from anything that Satan offers. And it always seems to make more sense to, well, you know, uh, like, like one of my, I remember one of my um, relatives told me one time, he said, you know, getting a woman's like getting a car. You need to test drive her first. Okay. All right. But what does that mean? <laughs> he didn't have a whole lot of appreciation for the whole, you know, wait till you get married type stuff. Shack up. Do whatever you want. Do, it, do whatever makes sense. It makes sense to, to pay your bills better or whatever. And God said, no, no, I've got a better way. It's more expensive, but it's a better way. Pursue him and run away from everything that Satan offers. Run to Jesus and run to the lost. Fight the good fight. Finish the course. Get your priorities in order. I need to do that. We as a church need to do that. We're starting a brand new decade of ministry in just a few weeks. We need to get ready. What does God want to do with Kingsland Baptist Church in the future? I want to encourage you to invest the rest of your life into those things that matter the most. I'm excited about entering a new decade of ministry in our church. I really am. God's enlarging our vision. And I would ask for you to pray about that. Pray for your church. Pray for yourself. And if you would, this is your invitation to just bow your heads and close your eyes and pray now and ask God to reorder your priorities as needed. It's so easy to get off track. It's so easy to lose your way. So ask him to reorder your priorities. Remember Jesus Christ. This is Thanksgiving. This is the holidays. Remember your Savior each and every step of the way. 
And I'm reminding you to pursue him. To run away, run away from the flesh and run to Jesus and run to the lost. I want to do this. I need to do this more. You do too. Invest the rest of your life in those things that matter most. And in one of them, one of them that's really important is your local church. You will be given opportunities over the next few months to invest financially, to invest your time, to invest your energy, literally hands in the dirt kind of stuff into this, into this ministry. I hope that you'll take the, the, take the challenge and that 2020 and beyond will be the best of your life. See, if we get too, caught looking in the rearview mirror too much, we'll look back, oh, those were the days. Everything was so easy back then. No, it wasn't. Can't live life in the rearview mirror. We remember God's faithfulness and we worship him and we praise him based on that. But today we've been reminded, study to show yourself approved unto God. Be diligent. Do your best today. A workman who does not need to be ashamed. When Christ returns, you don't want him to be embarrassed by you. And you don't want to be embarrassed at what you're doing. You want to be looking forward to his return. Properly, accurately handing the word of truth. Fleeing from the youthful lust. Listen, today is a day some of us just need to get right with God. Name that sin and repent. It could be a relationship sin. It could be whatever. For you and for the person down the road from you, it's probably something different, but it's, it's a lot of times it goes back to lust. Doing what's convenient. Doing what makes sense in our minds. Doing what we feel like doing. Run away from those things. Repent. Give it to the Lord. And run after souls. Lord God, I pray that you'd help us to be a church that runs after souls. Those who are so far from you, perhaps you will grant them repentance. Use us to find them. Use us to give them the gospel to do that which is most important. Use us to invest our lives into the local church. Invest our lives into your kingdom knowing that's the only thing that's going to matter a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, a billion years from now. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Lord, I pray that our vision for this church would be your vision for this church and that we would invest our money, that we invest our blood, sweat, and tears, that we invest our testimony, all that we have in to your local church moving into the future and see the great and mighty things that you can do that we can't even, things that are exceedingly abundantly beyond our capacity to even, even think about it. I pray that you do that in individual families, in individual lives, and in our church as a whole. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing. Come as God leads you.
Ed's going to come and dismiss our service in prayer. I just, and you may remain standing. I just want to remind everybody that we have our Christmas musical next Sunday night. So come, invite some friends. A lot of work's been put into this thing. Let's pack this place out and uh, get in the Christmas spirit. Okay. Well, let us pray. Father God, we, we know we come to this time of year. We emphasize Lottie Moon and, and bringing our money to help the missionaries abroad. And, and we also have missionaries in the North America, yeah, Lord. We just uh, just ask you to be with us this this month as we are focusing on all the different uh, countries around the world, Lord. Uh, I know we go to various countries, Lithuania and other places, Lord. But the missionaries are uh, in harm's way, like the one was in our Joshua house. He's in a place where he. He serves as a, uh, doing a lot of other stuff and actually brings you to the people there, Lord. And we ask you to be with these uh, missionaries around the world, Lord, and just be with us this holiday season that we will be in the mood to give uh, a little bit, what, whatever we can give, maybe uh, beyond what we normally give, Lord, because we have a, a great goal, but it's small compared to what the missionaries need this year. And just thank you for allowing them to proclaim Jesus all over the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us online or on Comcast Xfinity uh, this week. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the service. Uh, we at Kingsland exist to connect people with Christ. That's our mission. That's what we exist to do. And we want to get you connected with Christ. And we want you to join us on Sunday morning, if you are able, at 11 a.m. Uh, we have Bible studies at 9.30, uh, service at 11 o'clock at 8801 Perrymont Road. Uh, please feel free to contact us uh, throughout the week. And you can do that by phone number uh, 275-1285. Or you can contact the church office at office at kingslandbaptist.com. And we would be happy to get you connected with Christ. During the service, you might have made a decision to be connected with Christ. And we'd love to hear about that, and we'd love to be able to share more with you what it means to follow Christ as Christ came and He lived a life that we couldn't live, making it possible for us to be connected with Him. As He died on the cross for our sins, was buried, rose again three days later, defeating death, and if you put your faith and trust in Christ and you turn from your sins, Scripture tells us that you will be saved. So we hope that you join us uh, here in the coming weeks, and we'd love to see you.